Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. This is, of course, the show in which I celebrate uh, an artist and their body of worth. Now, Oprah Winfrey may have British royalty tonight, but we have cabaret and theater royalty because I am celebrating the one and only Sarah Louise Lazarus, and she deserves to be celebrated. Before I bring her on, I'm gonna give you all a sample of her work. Now, I wanna say a few things before I bring her on. First of all, I am a product of 1960s and 70s television. I grew up on the variety show. And I grew up when you had these great artists coming together. And sometimes uh, the big finale would be a great mel uh, medley of great songs, everything. Well, that's one of the fortes of Sarah. Along with Alex Rybeck and Jeff Harner, they have created magic in the theater and on cabaret. Now, if the pandemic wasn't happening, chances are myself and most of you would be sitting in a cabaret room tonight. And there is a very good chance that somewhere on the board somewhere would be a production directed by Sarah Louise Lazarus. She's directed everybody in the business. But take a look at her work and then you'll meet Sarah on the other end. <laughs> Sweet in the town, sweet in the town, sweet in the town. They call it the round of rag. It's got twisted 
think your drive's been saved. Drive's been saved. Drive's been saved. Drive's been saved. Because you find you never get it out of your brain. They call it the wrong note brag. Oh, bunny hug. Turkey trout. Give me the wrong note brag. Please play that happy note. Because the wrong note just makes me do 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 that right polite note because that right note just makes me blah 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 no no give me that new blue note and mister watch my dust watch my smoke and do in the wrong note rag telling you that if everybody began their day with this, there would be no strife in the world. Hello, Sarah. How are you? I'm great, Richard. How are you? I am so glad that you're here this evening. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Uh, that is just the def definition of collaboration above everything else. And we're going to talk a little bit about this in a moment. But I do want to remind everybody, sadly, uh, that today marks 360 days since our theaters and cabaret <sighs> rooms in New York shut down. And we are still in the midst of a pandemic. And I want to ask you, Sarah, how are you doing really in the midst of all this? Richard, I have been so blessed. I cannot tell you. So far, my husband and I and my son have all stayed healthy. He's down in Florida, but I, we've, we've all managed to avoid COVID. Um, I teach at Circle in the Square Theater School. And although this hit right, you know, right as we were entering the final two months of our classes, we immediately shifted to Zoom we had a wonderful teacher at Circle who shared, who taught us all about Zoom and, and really filled us in. And so we didn't miss a beat. And then uh, I've continued coaching at Paper Mill Playhouse. Uh, I, I coach for Paper Mill Prep, which is uh, a school or a part of Paper Mill, the Tony Award winning, you know, theater here in New Jersey where My I live. Theaters. And uh, I started with a man, a wonderful man named Stephen Augusto and another wonderful man, John Armstrong, Paper Mill Prep back in about eight years ago or so. And we coach students for their college auditions. And uh, so I was able to keep going with that throughout the summer on Zoom. And then Circle resumed on, on online this year, and we've really had a wonderful year online, very productive one so far. So I kind of haven't missed a beat. I mean, the thing is that, of course, actually, you know, Jeff and I had just done Carried Away, our revised version of what we did 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, it was such a huge hit. We won the Broadway World Award for Best Show, 
And we want to bring it back. And that we've not been able to do. We were about to start bringing revive, reviving uh, our Psych Holman show. Mm-hmm. And we haven't been able to do that yet. Um, so there have been certain things that have been put on hold. But basically, I feel so blessed that I've been able to keep working and keep stimulated and keep creative in what I know are very dark times for a lot of other people. Well, I'm glad to hear that you are being creative. A lot of people I'm finding that that are being creative are getting through this a lot easier than those who are not. I mean, those of us who are in the theater are very resilient. Let's just face that. Yeah. Um, and so we're not in that world of nine to five routines normally. So I can only imagine what it's like for those people. But going back, as I said, it has, today does mark 360 days. The theater shut down on March 12th of last year. What did your calendar look like uh, in addition to what you've just told us uh, on March uh, 11th of last year? Well, um, I was about to see two of my students on, on Broadway in, uh, I was supposed to see, uh, I guess actually the two that I was supposed to see at that point were uh, actually at the Manhattan Theater Club. Eric William Morris was doing a show there and uh, Matt Dalal, one of my other circle students was doing a show at uh, Roundabout and uh, Matthew Griffin, my wonderful student was uh, in playing Tina Turner's son in, in Tina the musical, and there are so many other people who, oh my God, my phone is going off. Um, Well, everyone's calling to talk to us. (laughs) I guess so. Um, But anyway, um, so it was very frustrating because so many of my students and people that I'd worked with obviously shut down. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it was just a, a difficult time in that way. Um, I had just come back from Florida, literally on March 7th, having uh, been there teaching a master class at Eckerd College, where my son actually was about to graduate, although he never had a live ceremony. Mm. And um, so that was sort of another frustration is that I feel so deeply for this poor generation that... um, was not able to gra- to graduate in person. I think that went for high school students and it went for college students. But for the college students who were finishing up their college lives and about to go into the world, uh, it was so hard. You know, they literally had a day or so to say goodbye to friends of four years who they might never see again. And all their plans, you know, they, they were taking the next couple of months to plan their futures and they never got to quite do that. So it was it was difficult in that way. And I'm blown away by how resilient my son was during those times. And he managed to find places to live down there because he wanted to stay in Florida. And of course, I didn't want him to fly at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but he really wanted to stay in St. Pete. It's such an amazing, amazing city. And a and great art community there. I've performed in St. Pete. They have a great theater community. There's art, there's museums, there's music. Every Friday night, the streets just open up and all the restaurants have music, That's have right. different bands. And so it's an exhilarating place to be. And uh, although their Saturday farmer's market is out of this world. Um, so it's a great town and he decided he wanted to stay. So he's been there and he's, knock wood, landed on his feet. He's an EMT and and he's in Marine Bio and a rescue lifeguard. And so he's managed to um, find work. He, you know, the most recent work was as as a COVID enforcer for, uh, for a TV company, for ABC, where wow. they were doing um, Christmas shows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Christmas, um, it, it's, it's their competition for Christmas lights. And so he was all over from fl- different parts of Florida to Louisiana to Texas. Um, and anyway, so, and he, he's now waiting for, uh, to be called for another enforcer job on who knows what he could go anywhere with with a film to Tokyo or Europe or New York maybe 
or That's LA. Wonderful. I'm sorry, I missed what you just said. I said that would be wonderful. That New York would be wonderful. Yeah. I'd get to see him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, it was, but I, as I say, I really feel for this particular group of graduates who had such, you know, just were thrust into the world without the, without the glory of a, of a graduate, of a live graduation ceremony and without, you know, really getting to say their goodbyes and, and get on their feet before they headed into the world. Absolutely. But, well, let me ask you this. Um, with all that you've done, um, have you taught virtually prior to the pandemic happening? Um, never. 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 I am, <laughs> as you've probably gathered, I'm not the most tech-savvy person in the world. <laughs> and, learning, as, you know, I've said to everybody, and I've said this before in uh, uh, former shows, that uh, we have such an appreciation now for the lighting guys and gals and the sound people and oh, all yes. the people that work to make it all happen. Uh, now, uh, all of us are doing this. I mean, there's Jam Kazam. There are all these things that right. people are doing to make it work. Um, let me ask you, before we really go into your career, uh, what have you been able to embrace uh, as far as the past year is concerned? What, have you or what are you still resisting? Uh, and what do you think that you will carry forward uh, once we are able to get back to whatever the new norm is going to be? I resist being able to hug people. I resist being able to go out to a restaurant with my husband. I resist being out to meet with friends in person. Um, I, it, you know, that's all, I'm a very people person and it's mm -hmm. very frustrating for me in that way. Um, I am beyond grateful for Zoom. I mm -hmm. think that is the amazing thing to have come out of COVID and that is something that allows us to communicate with people all over the world. Um, and now I was, I never really did Skype. I never really did FaceTime. And now we have this tool, you know, to teach students who otherwise we, you know, in, teach theater to mm -hmm. students we otherwise couldn't reach and teach musical theater. Um, and uh, so I think that that to me is, is the thing that I will take away from this is that even as we hopefully all get to see one another again and work together in person one and together, and of course, Cabaret is such an intimate place where you want an audience right there, and theater is, and, and is, is such a person-to-person -person experience, moment-to-moment -moment on stage, bouncing off your energy and your thoughts off of somebody else's energy in a very spontaneous and moment-to-moment and -moment way. And we haven't been able to do that. And I cannot wait for the time when that, when that occurs again. Now, there's a slow rollout happening right now in New York with the comedy clubs uh, and hopefully the cabaret rooms will be right behind that. Um, right now, you can only operate at 35%. And with all due respect to all of my cabaret brothers and sisters, some of us have already experienced that world <laughs> in cabaret. Um, but how do, you, <laughs> how do you anticipate cabaret coming back? You know, I, I can't really answer that. I, I know that it will because it's been around mm -hmm. forever. You know, people have have always wanted to commune in very small spaces and and do theater, do cabaret. Um, so I know that it will, but I I don't really I can't begin to predict when and how. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm concerned, I admit, about opening up too soon and having a new wave of this virus or of the variants of this virus. And I'm seeing um, photographs of the people that I love and respect that are doing shows down in Florida. I saw a lot of photographs today and there are no, there's no social distancing. Most of the people in the photographs that I saw were not wearing masks. Um, and it's, it, it's a real fear and concern of mine for those that I love. I, I am totally with you on that. I just, I think we need to be very patient and very cautious 
so that we really can find herd immunity, lick this thing, and and get back to all the things that we love mm-hmm. about being together that we took for granted before last March. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to take you down memory lane tonight. <laughs> okay. And I want to begin, I mean, uh, there's an old uh, song that I love called, You Must Have Been a Beautiful Baby, but you prove that song because here you are. <laughs> Can you tell I me can't see the picture, but <laughs> um, but I know the I, picture. I think you're with. Uh, would this be your grandparents that you're with? This is- Can you hear me? I think she froze for a moment. Uh, but My parent. Okay, no, I think you froze for just a moment. Uh, is that a photograph of you with your grandparents? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. It's of me with my grandparents, and uh, I must have been about three, and and my grandfather died when I was four, so that's how I sort of mm-hmm. have deduced what age I was at the time. But it's a wonderful picture. I had a great family growing up. We all lived in, in proximity of two blocks of one another, my mother and her two sisters and my grandparents. Um, and, you know, so it was a very close family where we got together a lot you know, and, and I feel very grateful for that background. Now, where did you grow up? Brooklyn. So you're a Ocean true New Park, Yorker? Ocean Park, Ocean Park, sorry? I said you're a true New Yorker. I'm a true New Yorker, Ocean Parkway and Beverly Road. And brothers and sisters? No, I'm an only child, spoiled, loved. <laughs> My parents were older when I was born. So I think that they treasured me all the more because they didn't even, you know, they didn't believe that I was really going to come. Uh, <laughs> and so when I actually finally was born, I was just this little little treasure to them. And uh, we had a really wonderful household growing up. My father, my mother was a teacher mm-hmm. and taught at Abraham Lincoln High School down toward Coney Island down Ocean Parkway, she could just drive straight down. And my father was a dentist, but he had worked his way through dental school and supported his brother through medical school by playing the violin, by literally fiddling in various dance bands and and orchestras at the time. And-, and then, No, go yeah. ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. And he, ta- he taught, he, he taught himself to play the piano and he could play by ear. So he could play in any key and anything. And he literally passed that on to me. And so I've always been able to play by ear. And he, he would come home from the office at night or on weekends and just sit down at the, the little baby grand piano in our living room and play and I would just run over and start singing with him. So when once he knew I liked to sing, every week he worked at the Fox Building in downtown mm-hmm. Brooklyn. And he passed G. Shermer, the music publisher on the way. And so he would literally bring a new piece of sheet music for me every week wow. and start playing it and I would learn it and start singing it with him. And soon I was doing Sarah Presents <laughs> for a captive <laughs> audience of my Grand, my grandmother and my two aunts and my mother. Um, <laughs> it was pretty hilarious. <laughs> but we literally had, you know, it was one of those great old, um, old pre-war buildings with, with big rooms, even though it was a one-bedroom apartment, and I literally slept in the bedroom with my parents. But we had this huge foyer, two steps down to a drop living room with the piano in the corner by the steps. Wow. So I had my orchestra, I had my audience, I had my stage. I could walk off to the bedroom through the through the hallway and had I had my wings in my dressing room. It was all just sort of built in for me to be, you know, to want to perform. And I did. <laughs> well, when, did audience, when did that audience grow beyond your parents and your grandparents? Well, you know, I was in actually was in an off-Broadway show. Uh, in my senior year of high school. And uh, then in in college, I was at Northwestern and I played Carrie and Carousel. And I was in the 
Northwestern's famous Wamu show, and I, I I was their Gilbert and Sullivan heroine in that, and I played me. Uh, played Peter Pan in in another segment. Um, And then I came right back to New York and I started working. And I literally was in town a month and auditioned for Equity Life, the old Equity Library Theater. Did you ever ever get to see anything at that? Absolutely. And I miss that theater so much. I miss it too. And I miss it for all my wonderful students who could have been, you know, doing work there. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I, I came to New York in 1979, but I want to ask you before we move fur- further, um, what was the moment for you? Uh, was it being in the audience of a show? Uh, was it being on stage? What was that moment when you decided this is the life for me? I, I, I have to, I'm sorry, but I have to take it back to my father. I have to take it back to singing with him and then playing on my own and singing for myself and then just being in shows along the way i i knew i think i knew from four years old that this was what i wanted to do and i didn't know that i was going to want to go on and direct and teach but i knew that somehow performance and music we're always going to be a part of my life. It's interesting. I saw an interview last night with Eartha Kitt, uh, and she said that when she was um, a young girl, she went to see Jose Ferrer in Surrender de Bergerac on Broadway. And it was the love that she felt that the audience was giving him that she mm. wanted for herself. And that's what she gravitated towards. Um, for you, what was it? Was I mean? Was it just the sheer excitement of performing? Was it the response that you got when you performed? What was the deciding factor for you? I just think it was my love of music. I think it was what that gift that my father gave me, and wanting to share that in some way or another. And loving theater. I mean, I, I grew up. Uh, you know, because I was in Brooklyn, I got, they took me to Broadway shows all mm. the time. Um, my first shows were at City Center. I think I saw South Pacific and Brigadoon. Um, and I, I got to see Ethel Merman in Gypsy mm. and then later play the role of Louise. Um, I, it just, the, the joy of Broadway and being able to grow up with it was so exhilarating for me. And I just always look forward to the moments that, you know, the the days that we go and and have, um, we would have like a a meal in the city, you know, usually at probably, you know, one of the the wonderful theater uh, restaurants and then then go to a show. And that was was my, my highlight of my life at that point. It was an event. Well, without your father, who were the mentors uh, that paved the way for you? Um, If you could name like three top people in your early years that really made an impact on your life and are still, you're still carrying those seeds today that they planted with you. Wow, I'm really thinking about that because um, most of the mentors that I think of happened later. I mean, I just, I think I intuitively was an actress and I was so grateful to be being cast in shows. But um, as I, as I acted and as I was in shows, the people that really were the most influential to me were probably Albert Haig, the man who wrote Plain and Fancy and uh, who taught classes in the city. And I met some of my very best friends in his class. Mm. And uh, then the man who changed my life was David Craig, the oh, yes. amazing uh, writer, lyricist, um, raconteur, and uh, teacher who was truly the teacher of the 60s 70s and 80s in the city and at the point he had to move to 
California because he had a heart condition. Mm -hmm. And his doctor said, go west or die. And so he moved out there and started a studio there. But he came back in the early 80s. And that's when I first took his class. And I was... I was frustrated at the time, but blessed because you were supposed to put your put your music down on the piano and the, the accompanist, Gary Carver, would literally call out a name from all the music that was on the piano and, that, and you'd get up and work. It took me two weeks for my name to be called. But in that two weeks, David always let people audit other classes as well as the class you were in. So I went to every single class. I was just so fascinated with it. And when I finally got up two weeks later and sang for him after having gone home every single night and shifted what I was doing based on what I'd seen that day in class, I sang and he said, well, why are you here? Because you already do what I teach. That's amazing. <laughs> Which was amazing. And so yeah. I sort of became his protege. And a couple of years later, his class literally when he was going back to the West Coast, they literally took me to Joe Allen's and asked me to teach and to teach them when he was gone. And so that's sort of one of the ways that my classes really formed. Well, you've just answered my next question. <laughs> I was going to ask, which came first, the directorial aspect of your career or the classes you started as a teacher? You know, they happened almost simultaneously. And this is this is something that I feel so grateful for. Um, I never said to myself, I want to direct. I never said to myself, I want to teach. I mean, but clearly as I was growing in the theater and as an actress and as a singer and working, and, and I, I was so blessed because I worked for, I worked nonstop mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was doing that. Um, clearly I was starting to look at my directors and think, hmm, I think I would do that a little bit differently. And people in the comp in my companies were starting to come to me and say, hey, hey, Sarah, could you work with me on this song that I have for an audition or on this monologue? And it all, as I say, in terms of the David Craig classes, that sort of came organically. And then I had been in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for several years at Theater by the Sea, mm -hmm. an equity company up there. It is I no longer there. with me. Yes. Pardon? I work there. At, at the one in Portsmouth? Yes, yes. Really? John Mary and Al Christie. It was John Kimball, right? Uh, John Vary and Al Christie. No, that's there, there's another company there now. Oh, uh, no, this was the but other. I was there when John Kimball and Russ Trays were there. And Russ Trays had, had directed me in the ELT as Young Sa and the version of Follies. Um, and just called me and asked me to come up and do a season, uh, several shows there, including the world premiere of Vanities as Joanne. And so I was in in Portsmouth for that reason. Mm -hmm. Where was I going from there? <laughs> well, <laughs> I lost I'm, my track. <laughs> and, and I apologize for that. You you That's went okay. there uh, as an actress. Uh, yes. Were you teaching there or doing workshops there as well? Well, it's funny you ask. I mean, I haven't thought about this, but yes, um, I actually, because I stay, I fell in love and I stayed on after the year that I was, the, the shows that I was there for. Mm -hmm. And there weren't always shows for me in the theater. And I had met this guy and we were living together. And so I just stayed on. My agent went in the city, went crazy, but <laughs> I did that. And um, so one summer I, um, I taught and uh, acted at the University of New Hampshire in their summer theater. And so I was Anne in Night Music and Salome in The Robber Bridegroom. Um, and so I, I, I got to get a sense of teaching there. And what was intriguing was I felt very insecure. But it turned out that when the kids had sent in their feedback on the various teachers, the woman who ran the program afterwards said to me, you know, you got the best feedback of anybody and people just loved your classes. So I went, oh, that's interesting. Um, 
But, oh, I know why Portsmouth. So I was in Under Milkwood there and a wonderful director and, and man named Al, Alfred Gingold. Uh, and I became just really good friends. And when I was finally came back to the city and was, you know, once again performing, um, Alfred one day gave me a call and said, hey, Sarah, um, I know you know so much about musical theater and I am direct, I am the artistic director of the Hangar Theater in Ithaca, New York, and I want you to come. I'm, I'm, I'm letting go the director who was supposed to direct Ernest in Love, the musical version of Ernest in Love, uh, because he just hasn't been in touch with me. And I feel like I, I, I couldn't, I, I didn't trust him anymore. And so I want you to come up and direct. And I looked, I just said to him on the phone, my God, Al Alfred, I've never directed. And he said, that's okay. I know you have it in you and what you don't know, I will teach you. Well, if that wasn't a gift, I don't know what was. And it was terrifying because I had two weeks literally to pull it all together before I drove to Ithaca. And my stomach was in knots the whole time. Well, I want to ask you, I mean, as you were preparing to go up there, you had two weeks to prepare. Uh, were you actually putting a plan together on how you were going to direct? Or were you finding that most of your time was uh, spent fighting the butterflies that were fluttering around? Oh, no, I, I, I knew I was preparing. <laughs> I'm somebody who prepares. And so I was absolutely going through the script. Um, and and figuring out cuts and working just on I, Alfred gave me some really great feedback on what to do in terms of the way I should be preparing and I remember driving up to Ithaca with the the the, the CD on in my car and coming up with the idea for the whole overture of doing a whole little prologue. So I was really being, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was actually having fun being inventive. And what I discovered was as terrifying as it was, I, I felt like I was home. Mm -hmm. I felt like sides of me that I had to suppress as an actress. Do you have any really distinct memories of that first day of rehearsal? Not of the first day of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. No, I have memories of some really wonderful things occurring during rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And I look, I, I haven't seen that. You know, I, ha I have a little, I think it, some kind of a video recording of it somewhere. And last time I looked at it, there were moments that just horrified me. I mean, I was so green and I really didn't know anything about scene, staging a scene. But I intuitively, and partly thanks to David's techniques, I intuitively knew how to direct a song mm -hmm. and stage it. And so there was there was some stuff that was perfectly awful, and there was stuff that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, and so it was a combination of both. And um, and but I had it in my company, Jimmy Jimmy Smiths actually. TV mm. actor, yes, and and was was in that company. He was in grad school getting his MFA at Cornell, and he was in my company playing Lane the Butler. <laughs> so it was an incredible company, and as I say, it was scary, but exhilarating. And I kind of came back knowing that that I needed to direct, and as I say, the the. The, the teaching came relatively spon spontaneously. I actually also started a class around the same time or maybe even a little bit earlier with Tommy Krasker. I don't know if you know Tommy from yeah, PS yeah. Records. Absolutely, yes. yes. But he and I had met when he was, he was from Portsmouth. So we had met in Portsmouth and became really the best of friends. And so we had started our own little classes too. But so, as I say, but it really all came organically. It wasn't like I set out to direct, set out to teach. It's just, 
I, I, I just I, I have I, a question it, for you. Um, on the spectrum, uh, and I'm talking specifically about your career as an actress. Uh, there are some that are incredibly ambitious in terms of the way that they go after work, and then there are those that are based on talent and everything. Lucky enough, because of the contacts that they meet along the way. And that's not to take away from their work. That's just to say that the way that their career unfolds. Um, and as, if you're that ambitious actress, you have that bug always within you that's constantly gnawing at you for the next job. When did this, I mean, you talk about, you knew that you were gonna come back as a director, but did the desire to be the actress uh, somehow dissipate as that was taking over in your life? It actually did. It actually did. I, I, and I, I'm also a very pragmatic person. Mm. And I realized that as much as I was working, um, that there were so many other really phenomenal actress singers around me. And I began to realize that what I do as a teacher and director is kind of special. And I don't mean to say that in a conceited way, but I felt that I really, I was at a point when I was ready to share myself. Well, can I and, say and for you? Um, because I've been reading uh, comments and the testimonials uh, from so many in this business. And the one uh, through line that I get from everyone that you work with is that in the, that you bring everyone to this level of finding their authentic self in terms of the characters that they're playing and the songs that they're singing. What is it that you're able to go in and pinpoint and, you know, with all due respect, has there ever been a situation where you've had a struggle with someone to help them find that authentic self? And what do you think those blocks are that we as artists put up that prevent us from getting where you want us to go? Well, I think the biggest block, but the, the thing that I see is people are always trying to please. And they are always trying to second guess what people want from them. And that's auditors, that's audiences. Um, and so that, that, that I think, and also there's just, we've seen a lot of presentational stuff and performance through the years. And, and a lot of actresses and singers, or singers actually tend to mock that um, or use that and it becomes inauthentic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that is the block, but I don't know. I, I, one, of the, one of the gifts I seem to have been given and thank you to wherever it came from, probably my parents, um, is that I can sort of see what's unique and special about each person. And I've discovered I have the words to bring that out. And I don't take that gift lightly. Um, I, I feel very blessed. And the satisfaction of, of where so many of my students have gone in this business. Well, be, I, 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 I don't want to run out of time because I want to share some more of your work. Uh, this is with your students at Circle in the Square, and we'll continue the conversation on the other side. Okay. Come with me, Come with me, Come with me and we shall run across the sky and illuminate the Yeah. 
That's wonderful. I want to ask you, when did the work begin for you in Cabaret? And I want to talk specifically about this amazing collaboration with you and Alex Rybeck and Jeff Horner. Uh, 30 years the two of you have been working, uh, the three of you have been working together. Yeah, um, well, actually, it all started <laughs> um, when with this David Cray class of mine and uh, the, the accompanist who had played for the first summer that I taught um, got another job and sent in this sub. And uh, he was late the first class, and I had to literally walk up to him the first day and say, don't you ever do that again. Um, and And... It took, I had no idea of what he thought of me, but he stayed. And it took about uh, a month or so until I suddenly, my phone started ringing off the wall with people saying, I'm studying in a class that Alex Rybeck is playing for. And he's told me to come to you. He's told me that you, he really, I really need to study with you. And so that person was Alex Rybeck. And that was the beginning of our our friendship, our he's still to this day one of my closest friends, mm -hmm. and uh, we, have, we we continue to teach together. Not as much as we did, but uh, certainly a whole lot. Um, and a couple of years into, maybe even a year or two into Alex and I teaching together, he brought in a young singer who had just been starting out in the clubs, and his name was Jeff Harner. And so I worked with Jeff and I saw, as he once said to me, he quoted, quoted um, A Star is Born. Uh, he, said, he said that I, you know, I saw something in him that he never saw in himself. Mm. And we just loved working together. And I watched him just become so much more expressive, discover his sense of humor, which is, so rich and so creative and we just loved one another and then years later when he was had just gotten his first mac award the phone rang and i picked it up and he said sarah i've always had this dream of having you direct me and i'm about to take the next step and that was carried away mm. and uh we just discovered that alex and he and i had this great chemistry together that we kind of balanced one another um and and we can't we can't i can't even tell you where an idea started or was forwarded and who had it first because we just when we're starting to work together that's sort of how it would go and uh so anyway that was that collaboration and it led to are creating the 1959 Broadway songbook literally in my in my apartment on 110th Street, and it played at the Algonquin, and you know basically started a number of years at the Algonquin that we were able to create new shows yearly. Um, we I think we've done something like eight shows together. We, we started doing late shows, you know, of his Gersh, uh, we created a Gershwin show. You remember those days? <laughs> oh, I do. Oh, the those late shows. Days. I know, I know. But anyway, you know, and to this day, you know, we get together. We, we got together on, uh, on Carried Away when we revised it. Mm -hmm. And it was as if we'd never been apart, except we had 30 years of experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why this time it's hit as hard, if not more so than the very first time. And, you know, we got our, our you know, Broadway World Award for it as best show because it's extraordinary. And Jeff himself yes. has grown as a performance. I have to show you something. Okay. I just want to talk about Jeff Harner for a second. I don't know if you can see this. There you can see it. Yes. Um, <laughs> you can hold and, it up higher. Okay. This is an award. However, the Broadway world does not give out awards, nor do they have a ceremony. So one day, about a month ago, I went to the mail, and th this had arrived. Jeff had made this award 
for Alex and for me for Carried Away for our Broadway World Award. That's the kind of person he is. That's the kind of creativity he brings. He's probably one of the most generous people in this business. He really is. The his and his integrity is unsurpassed in my in my experience. Well, you know. I'm a huge fan, and I, as I said when I interviewed him the other day, he is the goalpost that yeah. all of us aspire to. I want to ask you before we do run out of time. Uh, uh, since you have come into this world of cabaret and theater as well, uh, the business has changed a lot uh, for all of us. What are the things that you really love the most about the changes in the business? And what are the things that you find that you still are not too crazy about? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I love the fact that the business is becoming more diverse, that we're embracing, that theater always sort of has been at the forefront and, and cabaret of embracing differences and diversity. And I think that that's something that in the theater is happening more and more. I know it certainly has happened at Circle, um, where, you know, where we have really revised a curriculum to, embrace diversity. That's great. And we've brought in new teachers to embrace that. Um, so that's one of the exciting things about the changes. Um, it's very hard to talk to students and talk about Ethel Merman and Jimmy Durante and Bing Crosby and see their faces go. Can I share something with you? Yeah, sure. Um, I asked you about uh, your mentors. My mentor was a wonderful woman named Florence Epps. I used to go, she had a playhouse in her backyard. And I used to go to her home every Wednesday and Thursday for elocution lessons. I had an accent you could cut with a knife. Oh. Um, <laughs> I would go and, um, and then we would talk about uh, the classics, the actors that went before us. And if a name came up, like you just mentioned, Ethel Merman, and if the name would come up, she would stop me, and she and these are the days before Google, and she would say, tell me three things that Ethel Merman is known for. And if I couldn't answer that question, she would say, I will see you next Wednesday at the same time. <laughs> no, come back and tell me three things about her. She instilled in me that every, and I still think of this before every broadcast, before every show, that when I step in front of the camera or on stage, that I'm carrying the mantle of everyone that's gone before me. And if a name comes up that I don't know, I look them up. I wanna know who they are. And I agree with you with what you're saying there. Yeah, it's always, it's always just stunning to me, you know, but one thing that I always do, of course, is very much what, what she did, you know, which is say, if, if they don't, I say, you know, we really need to look them up or else I share about them and what they did and then ask them to go forward. This year, actually, we've instituted, I instituted in my classes having everybody, I, I came up with a book list and I had everybody read a different book and share. And so I think they've had a better sense of the history of, of performance, the history of theater. And uh, I, I just think that they've gotten a lot out of that. And it's satisfied me that they're, they're suddenly knowing a lot more than they did before. And Sarah, are you doing one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, through this new medium now? I am. I am. And I, if I, they want to get in touch with you, how can they get in touch with you? Oh, uh, how can they get in touch with me? They can, they can Facebook messenger me. Um, they can email me at Sarah Lazarus at Comcast.net. Uh, I, I guess those are the two best ways at the moment to reach me. Um, but as, as I say, Facebook Messenger is a really great tool. And uh, for all, all the questions about Facebook in terms of this business and sharing and feeling close even during the pandemic, uh, I think Facebook has been very wonderful about, in terms of that. Well, I can't believe this, but we are at the end of our show. Oh, my gosh. Um, uh, and we're going to end with another clip. 
uh, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful jo uh, Josh Lance Dixon, who I love. We've got a great clip of your work with him as well. Um, before and he was, just so you know, he was my student at Circle. He took our, my professional class with Alex. And then this clip is from It Helps to Sing About It, a show that we did six uh, in 2016 at, at the Metropolitan Room and that won Bistro Awards and Mac Awards and such. Uh, and but Josh is just amazing, and this song won best best song for the year for Mac. Now and before, he's wonderful. Before we get there, however, I want to thank everyone for being here, um, and I want to let everyone know if you're around tomorrow night at seven uh, at five o'clock tomorrow night, I'm celebrating the one and only John Davidson. Um, did the two of you ever work together? Never, never. No. Amazing. I am so excited about this. That's great. Even a special opening uh, with one of his uh, Disney co-stars from his first film. Uh, that's a clue. Uh, so please tune in tomorrow night for that. I want to thank everyone for being here. If you enjoyed the show, and I hope you do and did, uh, whatever platform you're either listening to this on or watching this on, please leave a comment. And if you're watching this through Facebook, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Put your thoughts about the show. Please let everyone else know about this, what we're doing. I also end every show by asking everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list. Go to the sixth name that pops up today and reach out to that person and say, how are you? With a phone call, not an email not a text message, not a private message, a phone call. As our dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. You never know what someone else is going through. So please, please, please reach out. And before we end, Sarah, I wanna thank you for the gifts that you've given to our community, uh, to the world of theater and cabaret, uh, both as an actress, and as a director and as a teacher. Um, I wanna give you the final word. Anything that you wanna say about anything that we've talked about that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you wanna put out to everyone who's watching now. And again, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, it was a joy, Richard. Um, I, I came up, I was looking for quotes and I came up with this, I found a quote that I thought was extraordinary and that really is what I do believe in life. And the quote is, I believe that everything happens for a reason. People change so that you can learn to let go. Things go wrong so that you can appreciate them when they're right. And sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together. And do you know who wrote that? Who? Marilyn Monroe. Wow. Wow. Isn't wow. that amazing? That's great. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Sure. Thank you. And here's Joshua Lenz Dixon. It's the summer I turn five. And I can tie my shoe My world is full of Lincoln Logs And Captain Kangaroo Blue and red makes purple Guess what I can do? My blocks are on the floor We have a cat And daddy doesn't live here anymore Yes and no makes maybe Two and two makes four I can tell time
Daddy visits when he can. I'm almost four feet tall. He says he'll see me Saturday. The clock is on the wall. Days have lots of hours, and I count them all. Oh. 